As we approach the end of another year, we want to spotlight some of the best works of literature the world gave us in 2023. The Atlantic 10, compiled by members of the magazine's books team, are the top titles that made them think this year. Joining us now is the senior editor for books at The Atlantic, Gal Beckerman. Gal, thanks for being here. Before we dive into what really is a great list, I'm curious how you all winnowed this down to just a short collection with so much great work done this year. Well, I think first it's important to underline our, our measure that we had, which was books that make you think. You know, there's, I think uh, we always felt that best is a very subjective sort of measure. So for us at The Atlantic, it was important to think of books that sort of stopped and, uh, and sort of allowed you to put some distance between yourself and aspects of reality that people sort of take for granted, right? So um, books that really made you, made you pause, but also books that were, were page turners in their own kinds of way. So let's start with a work of fiction called Burnham yeah. Wood. What jumped out to you about this book? I, I really I love this book. It's a, it's by a New Zealand uh, author. Um, this is actually uh, it's it's a book that's it's a bit of a sort of a social novel, almost in the style of a 19th century novel, but it's also a thriller. Uh, and it, it, the story is about a group of environmental activists in New Zealand who are looking for plots of land where they are illegally planting gardens. Um, and the story gets very intense because there's a sort of a billionaire, almost like an Elon Musk type character, who makes them an offer to, to greatly expand uh, their enterprise, and it gets them into all kinds of moral, uh, deep moral moral quandaries. And so the book uh, is an amazing character study about this group of activists, but it's also um, in many ways about these big questions about how do you balance idealism and pragmatism, uh, you know, how people's selfishness and greediness sort of gets in the way of their best intentions. Um, really, uh, really a wonderful book. It sounds good. We'll put that one in the cart. Let's move to nonfiction, uh, a book yeah. called The Best Minds. There seems to be some level of consensus about this this year. This also was on The New York Times list of the 10 best books of the year. For people who haven't read it, tell us more about the story behind The Best Minds. Yeah, I mean, this is a book that I would say is among my favorite nonfiction books in the last 10 years, not even just the last year, because it does something so well, which it melds, uh, it melds memoir, there's a level of memoir here, and there also is sort of a big social issue that he's trying to, to really confront. The memoir part of this is uh, Jonathan Rosen, the author, uh, grew up with a young man named Michael Lauder, who was his, his neighbor, they were best friends. The part of this book is very much sort of a, a portrait of a friendship, uh, a male friendship, which we uh, we don't really get to see so much in, in books, actually. Um, but it's, it's complicated, there's complicated Competition between them, uh, Michael. It becomes is a very brilliant, um, and and uh, and and Jonathan Rosen sort of always measured himself against him. As they grow older, um, Louder's Michael Louder's brilliance kind of continues to shine. He finishes Yale in three years, um, but he also becomes diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, and at some, you know, at, at various points, he becomes almost a, a model of somebody who can live with that mental illness. He ends up going to Yale Law School. There are New York Times articles written about his genius. But but something very tra tragic happens, which is Louder ends up uh, murdering his his fiance. Um, so Rosen uh, uses this story and his complicated relationship uh, with his friend to try to unpack sort of how we as a society um, deal with schizophrenia, with mental illness. Um, there was there was a lot made of Louder's sort of brilliance and his ability to integrate fully, um, and at a moment of deinstitutionalization uh, of, of mental illness, and and Rosen really unpacks all of this, these sort of complicated questions about how we deal with that issue. And Gal, let's turn to another book here, but though another one that draws its inspiration from a, a challenging diagnosis. This is The Country of the Blind by Andrew Leland, who writes about what happened to himself. Yeah, no, this is, and again, another book where you have a, a sort of a memoir element to it, but it very much sort of leads into an exploration of, a, of, a, of, a, of an issue at a very deep and personal level. Uh, Leland was diagnosed in his in his teen years with, a, with an eye condition that would mean that by the time he met middle age, it would sort of happen slowly, he would eventually go blind. Um, and so he's writing this book in his 40s. He's lost a lot of his sight, but he's about to enter what he calls, you know, the country of the blind. And 
and and he what's remarkable to me about this book is he's sort of standing at the precipice of this experience that you know i think most of us would sort of think about uh as being um you know incredibly daunting d depressing to sort of enter and an and idea of sort of parts of your world being closed off and and leland instead says you know i'm about to enter the sort of a new experience of of being alive being alive as a, as a blind person let me explore all the aspects of this and there's not an ounce of sort of self-pity um, or sadness here. He just really wants to understand sort of at a, a phenomenological level, you know, what this is actually going to sort of be like to, to be blind. And in a way, it's a beautiful book because it, it it sort of forces all of us to think about the changes that happen in our lives that, that we think about as sort of uh, somehow lessening our experience is actually something that sort of widens us out into something new. It's a great list. I was also happy to see ours was a shining future on my bedstand by David Leonard, the great New York Times journalist as well. You can learn more about The Atlantic 10, books that made us think the most this year at theatlantic.com. Senior editor for books at The Atlantic, Gal Beckerman. Gal, thanks so much for bringing this to us. We appreciate it. Oh. Always, always happy to talk about books. <laughs> Thank you. That does it for us this morning.